Alright, um, alright, we're, the legs are done. Almost. I'll show you a couple little things i got to fix on them, this episode or next. I want to do the apron next. The first thing I'm going to do is lay these out and see if there's any kind of, uh, preferred face. And I'm going, not that you'd be able to follow the grain around because there's the interruption of the leg, so I don't think it's going to matter that much, but if I have any blemishes at all, I want them on the inside. So these are the four pieces. They're already squared up. Now those two look exactly the same, so there really isn't anything to worry about there. That one looks the same. Okay, now this one, there's a couple of little swirly spots that were... I don't even know what it is. Not that it really matters. I'll keep this face. And same thing on this one. I'll keep this face. Now... that. I'll just number these corners so we, when we come down to putting them in the legs, we have them uh, properly identified. So one, two, three, four, five. Keep it far enough in so that we don't cut that piece off. Hand me a Kleenex, please. Excuse me. All right, I'm going to set these off to the side. And I may do a couple of these just to show you some options. But I'm going to go ahead and I'll, I'll cut the tenon on one end. I'll walk through that whole process. Normally what I would do is take my setting and work through all of them. But this will give us a chance to go back and, and redo something for a little more reinforcement. Excuse me just one second. Hope I'm not developing an allergy to wood. Could be life altering. So that was the marking gauge that we used to gauge the depth. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shorten it up just a little bit. That way I know I not I don't end up bottoming out. So I'll take that setting and describe all the way around, nice and deep. And it really pays to have that deep when it comes time to using the crosscut saw to create that shoulder. Do both sides of this. And I've got enough gauges that I can set this aside so it doesn't get changed between now and the time that I get around to doing the other three aprons. Okay, now we have got to do some figuring out here. Remember that this tenon is going to be offset. Actually, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'll show you how to set this up. There are a lot of different mortise and gauges you can find. Never really found one that I liked. So I actually developed this one with a friend of mine who does all the brass work for us. And you can buy it as a separate little attachment that you take the main screw, make, take that screw out of your marking gauge, and you replace it with this piece. So I'm using the exact same cutter. And then I'm adding this piece and this little brass knurled piece up on the end. So I'll open that up, set my chisel down in between the two, tighten that up, and then come in here with this brass piece and it'll lock it. So now that represents the exact width of the mortise chisel. That gives me a little handle, but it locks the two in place so it doesn't move on me. So that's all set. Now, we have to decide where this is going to go in relation to the mortise on that leg. So Frick, if you want to get in fairly close right here, I, I've got to make sure that I've got enough reveal out here that it doesn't look like a miss. If you get, to, if you get too close like that, it would be too easy to have it disappear just in the process of cleaning these pieces up. So I need enough but I also at the same time I want to have, I think I originally allowed, I wanted to have an eighth of an inch for a shoulder. So if we set it right about there, I'll just mark that with a pencil. It's going to be on that side. 
So I'm going to put this in the vise. I'm going to set. I'm going to reference off of the outside face. I'm going to set my marking gauge. Irvin, you want to come right around here and shoot right in this way. There's my mark. I'm going to set my marking gauge so that that gauge line is it light enough that you can see? Okay, lock that tight. Now, when you're using a, mar a, a mortise engage, when you use a marking gauge first, the shape of the cutter is such that when you drag it, I'm sorry, I moved on you fast. When I drag it through the wood like this, the shape of the cutter pulls the tool this way, keeping the head of the tool tight to the face. However, on a mortise engage, those two um, cancel each other out. So it's up to you to keep the head of the tool tight to the outside face. So that's why I'm going to use my opposite hand to grab hold of this brass knurled piece to be pulling it. And I prefer to go in and make a couple of light passes and then just keep deepening it with each successive pass. You find that there's a lot more control that way than to try to go in and do one pass or one deep pass and that's where sometimes things uh, get out of control because the overpowering effect of those cutters in the direction that you're pulling the tool. Now I want to come down the face and stop at that line and then do the same thing on this back side. And the nice thing about round cutters or round marking gauges is that you can just roll that last little bit to get it precise. Okay, so now I know where I need to make my cuts. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and mark in. This is the top side, correct? Yep. I'm just going to take it right off of this leg, and I'll just transfer these lines. I'm laying this part of it out now because I'm guaranteed a nice square shoulder or a square face to work off of. Once we actually cut them, we may or may not keep it perfectly square. Doesn't make that big of a difference, but I'd rather have a surface that I know I can trust than to one that might be a little bit iffy. You'll see what I mean after we do the sawing. Okay, so this is waste. This is waste, and this little bit over here is waste. So now we've got to make two cuts with the tenon saw, one on this side, one on that side. Then we'll come in and do my shoulder cuts with a, a cross cut saw. And then I'll come in as a final step and I'll make the uh, cut down through with a dovetail saw is actually what I'm going to use to make these uh, rip cuts that will define this edge, this edge, this edge, this edge, this edge of the tenon. Okay, so I want to keep that low in the vise. Now let's see if I can do this without having to bring in a bench lamp because I know it screws up, screws up the lighting for you guys. Jake, grab me another Kleenex, please. Keep that low so that it's, uh, it doesn't vibrate at all and the vise will keep it nice and tight. Now, let's talk about a tennis saw for a minute because we haven't used it before, at least not on this ep any of these episodes. You've got to have sufficiently heavy teeth because the gullets fill up with sawdust when you're cutting. So the deeper the gullet, the uh, faster the cut's going to be. However, uh, most tenon saws are in the 10 TPI. I made mine at 12 TPI just because it's a little less grabby, a little easier to control if you're someone that's only doing this occasionally. And I put those same starter teeth out front with a minus 30 degree cutting angle. That's a slight modification from what you heard me say before. And uh, the set is just two thou per side. So these teeth are alternately bent just two thousandths of an inch out from the saw plate on either side. So it gives you a pretty nice tight um, curve. So I'm going to work on the uh, left side. I'm going to come in here, tip the saw forward. Now I, I want to preserve, let me, let me exaggerate this a little bit. That marking gauge left me a cut that looks like this. There's a chamfer on the waist side. So I want to preserve, if you can see this, if I were to draw an arrow, I want to preserve this side of the V. 
And the idea is to try to be able to take this joint right from the cut. It's not very often that I can do that on a tenon, especially with this long of a cut. So I'll usually have to come in and do a little modifying to get it the perfect fit. So Irvin, if you want to focus right on here and then they can see. Now you'll notice that I'm tipping this off forward. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to saw on an angle and I'm going to come right along that line until I establish this line. There, some will saw the whole thing on a 45, well not the 45 because you couldn't on this one. But they have a tendency to, they, they cut like this. I, I can't do that. I establish this line first, then I'll worry about the vertical line paying attention to this face. Okay, so that line is established. I don't have to worry about that. Now I've just got to get it or make it nice and vertical. Okay, I'm paying attention down here. You can you come in around this side. I can't go below my line. So I've got to make sure I don't go too low. There's my baseline. How wide is it? Six inches? Five and a half. So fairly, fairly uh, big cut. This is where you want to have as little set as possible. And that presents the, prevents the blade from wobbling in the cut. And it helps to track. If you don't, if you've got too much set, then you get a real wobbly curve. And the, uh, well, I wasn't paying attention, I was talking. You get a wobbly kerf, and the sides of your uh, tenon are left quite rough. Now, I actually went a little bit too low over here, almost. Should have been paying closer attention. Okay. So, come over here, Irvin, and have a look at this. How'd we do on this side? That might have been one of the better ones I've done. So, can you hone in on that real close? Nice, clean kerf. See how nice and straight that is? Come up, view your camera so you're shooting down this way. No, lengthwise. Yeah, there, good. Nice, that's the shot I want. Okay. Now we're going to do the same thing on the opposite side. Now this is where I would normally want a lamp. In fact, I'm going to get a lamp. Jay, can you grab the bench lamp for me? Hopefully this won't get in your way. I need to illuminate this side so that I can see. I was almost having to go on a wish on a prayer in that last one because I couldn't see it very well. Plug it in right above your head over here. So that it's not in their way. Okay, now can you still... You're just going to have to work around that a little bit. So now I can I can, uh, I can see this a heck of a lot better. I can come in here with my finger. I'm going to move this a little bit forward. Okay, I want you to focus. Actually, Irvin, come over here and look over my shoulder. they got to, they got to be able to see this. All right, I want you to focus right here. By the way, Irvin is a friend of Frick's. He's just here for a few more days visiting cameraman. Can you get a little higher? Always try to get my eye view of my finger right here. We're a little close, aren't we? <laughs> right? You see that? So I'm spreading lateral pressure against my fingernail and I'm moving the saw over. Okay, once I get it started, once I get a little bit of kerf right there, now I can move along that line. I left it a little bit fat. So I'm up here now. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm, I can't, I've got to stop when I do this because I'm constantly blowing the sawdust out of the way. What I want to tell you is I'm letting the saw, the weight of the saw do the work. I'm not pushing down so that I have lots of control as I move that saw curve or cut along that line. Okay, now once I'm there, now I'll put a little bit of downward pressure, speed the cut up. Irvin, come back over here. 
I want you to look right, what I'm gonna do now is I wanna focus on right here, on this vertical line. Okay, we're down to there. Now, I'll tip back up and I'll let, come back up here, I'll let the, uh, that initial saw curve take over and guide the cut. But if you can see right there, you can see a little bit of the uh, marking gauge line. It shows up as a little white strip. I don't know if you can see it or not, but I suspect I'm going to be just a little bit fat as a result of that. Now at this point, you don't want to overpower the saw. And by that I mean you want a light enough, back here on the handle, look at my handle. You want a light enough grip on the handle that the saw kerf is guiding the saw cut. If you squeeze too tight back here and you take over, this isn't going to do what it's supposed to do. And that's uh, a hard habit to break because if you don't have strong sawing muscles from not having done this, you tend to overcompensate by squeezing excessively hard with your grip and you don't um, you just don't have the touch. You gotta work on that. Okay, I'm just watching that line. I get close. It's right about there. Alright, now I would I'd go through and do the other ones and then do every step repetitively, but I'm gonna actually go right from here. I'm gonna go over and cut our uh, make these cross cuts and then we'll come back and do this. We'll do this on a separate episode if I think we need it. Okay, I'm gonna bring my bench hook. I don't know if I talked about bench hooks before. If I haven't, let me tell you quick. It's nothing more than something to protect my bench. It'll hold the workpiece. It's got a cleat out here in the front that catches on the front edge of the bench because my sawing, using the western saw, is cutting on the push. So it's going to keep the board from the, being cut from moving that way. And the uh, fence on the back side stops short of the end of the shooting board so that I'm cutting into the shooting board each time, again, not into my bench. That's nothing fancy. All right, turn that off. I don't, I don't need it now. Okay, how are we for time, Frick? Just so I can gauge. 17 and a half. So we're, all right. We have 13 time. minutes left. Okay, there's a couple ways we can do this. I'm gonna do this uh, the first way, which is probably gonna require the most skill. I'm just using my marking gauge line. I'm holding the piece firmly against the fence. Now my crosscut saw, if I haven't already talked about that, and if you're looking for a crosscut saw, um, finer teeth, smoother cut, but that's not necessarily the controlling factor. Again, it's the set. When I made my saw, I purposely had it made with only two thou set per side, so there's very little raking, and you can get a nice, clean shoulder right off of the saw, which again, that's what I'm trying to do. I don't want to have to go in with the shoulder plane and do anything if I can avoid it. So it's 15 TPI, and I would suggest you be somewhere in the uh, 13 to 15, 16 TPI range. But what you need is to have very minimal set. And uh, obviously it needs to be nice and sharp. Now I'm going to, uh, I'm going to squeeze with my thumb back here. Are you, are you catching this? You want to go on a little bit of a wide shot. Squeeze with my thumb, keep it tight to the fence. Then I'm going to use my index finger. I'm actually going to turn the light on here. I, I, I need it again. Get some power there, Jake. Can you get an extension cord while we're working so that the boys don't have to trip over that? Then run along the bottom. Okay, I'm going to use my index finger. Now, Irvin, I actually, I want you back over here again. Can you get right over my shoulder? And I know there's not enough, not a lot of room between the lamp. No, I want you on this side. Anybody getting seasick? <laughs> okay, so you're looking right here again. So I'm using my index finger. I'm just a little bit forward of the end of the board, and I'm tipping the saw a little bit of an angle, and I want to get that I want to get those teeth to start cutting right in that V created by the marking gauge line, preserving on this case the left side of the V, sawing out the right side, and I'm having to blow the sawdust so I can constantly see my line. That's why I'm not able to talk. Okay, so there's what I talked about. Getting that one, that one line perfect first, then worry about my vertical drop. Now, that's the other part of this that you have to master, and that is the vertical drop, because if we cut, undercut, 
or got cut the opposite way, we're gonna have to come in here and with a dress it up with a chisel or with a with a shoulder plane. So um, can you focus right down here, Irvin? There's not this is a very small cut, so there's not going to be a whole lot to do. So easy. Do you feel it start to break free? I don't want to cut into that tenon any more than I have to. Okay. Now, let's have a quick look at that. Okay. You can see, you can see what look appears to be, and in fact I know it is, right here. I kind of missed this. There's the, uh, can you hone in on that? There's the, uh, that's the marking gauge cut that you see right along there. And that might be okay. I did a better job of it down here. See how it's almost gone? As I, as I move my finger along here, you can see that there's material that shouldn't be there. And then as we cut out here, it disappears. This is, this is where it needs to be. So I may have to come back in with a chisel and clean that up. It's all right, you need to learn how to do that too. Okay, now we'll flip it over. This is gonna be a deeper cut. This is where the vertical is gonna be more critical because we don't wanna undercut that at all. So again, squeeze with my thumb. Use my index finger as a uh, guiding point. Always a little bit of lateral pressure with the saw. Nice light, 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 light grip on the saw. It just, uh, the saw will do what it's supposed to do if you just give it a little bit of effort forward and back and aim it, get it started. And uh, I'm always, you'll notice I'm always blowing that sawdust off so I can see that line and I teach folks to do this and they rarely do that so I'm not sure how they get away with it. You tell me when I'm down to that line back there. Okay, I'm touching it here. Am I close? Yeah, it is. It not broke free yet. Maybe just a little bit. I may not have taken my tent, my cut with my tenant saw deep enough. A little bit into that tenon, but it's not it's not that big of a deal. Cut into it more back there though. Small enough, I don't need to make it any weaker. Alright, now I'm gonna go in, set that in the vise, and I need my uh, combination square to lay this out. Alright, this uh, this is actually the inside. So I'm going to mark it on this side. always want to work from the face side. That way if I were to accidentally cut a little bit low and score this, it would be on the inside, not on the show face. So I'm going to come in with my combination square. You're going to be on my right side now. Set that to be a little bit higher than... I didn't want to touch on the shoulder, so I want to make sure I'm referencing off of the top or the end of the tenon. And then just go in and transfer those marks that I made across the end, down the face. Alright, now these cuts are fairly small. The stock is only three-eighths of an inch thick. So I'm going to use my dovetail saw because I have better control than I did or I do with my larger tenon saw. Right, so I'll get my lamp position so that I illuminate here and here. Come in and I just barely preserve the line. Careful at the bottom, 
You don't want to score the shoulder, front or back. Now, here's an example of what happened. Look up here. See how I, I, I nicked that? At least it's on the inside, not on the outside. So always work from your face side. All right, come back over here. And I'm going to do all of the ones where I'm cutting to the left before I change my lamp. Okay, right, now we're going to go the other side. Now on this one, just notice how I changed my hand. Oh, no, no, I'm up here on my shoulder. I'm going to move my thumb out of the way so I can see the line. But I still create a good anchor point with my index finger, my thumb supporting it. Press laterally against it so that I've always got enough pressure here that won't allow this saw to skirt one way or the other. Same way when we're cutting dovetails. This stuff cuts like butter. Okay, now I've got to get rid of a fairly heavy chunk right there, so I'm going to use my fret saw same way I would if I was clearing dovetail waste. Drop down to the bottom, come just off the bottom. Now, I'm going to use my uh, my half inch chisel and I'm going to get rid of this while it's standing. It's easy enough to do. I can come in here, actually I'll do the back side first, then finish from the face side. Set that in there, just raise it up. I'm undercutting it just a little bit. It's end grain, we're not losing any valuable glue surface. And by undercutting it slightly, I don't run the risk of having a bump that has to get removed or prevents the joint from seating. And this is just speeding it up, rather than having to move it onto the bench and do this, I can do it right here. All right, now that part's done. Now, I'm going to continue this where the uh, tenon saw didn't go all the way to the bottom. Easy to do it with a chisel. Check the back side. Okay, back over here, same thing. Didn't make it all the way down. Now, I've got to come in and make these cuts. Two minutes. Two minutes? Okay, that's all right. That'll give us enough time to finish this. I'll show you something that I did accidentally. When I built this bench, I ended up with a crack that ran all the way along the bench. So rather than fill it full of something other than, well, I shouldn't say because I did fill it, I made it a little bit wider and I put in this piece of bloodwood. Now, it ended up looking like a decoration, but actually when it comes to setting a board in the vise and getting it horizontal, I just have to use that line, eyeball the top of my board along that line and it works perfectly. So it's an accident that ended up working in my favor. Alright, so we're going to cut this shoulder off. Yep, same spot. Got to be careful, we got to make sure the cut is plumb. We don't want to undercut the shoulder. And I don't want to have to come in and do more to this, so if I can get it right from the saw, I'm ahead of the game. That's on the bottom bottom side where we have a very small reveal. Now, the reason I always want the piece standing level is because it reinforces my ability to make uh, vertical cuts by feel. All right, now you want to be over this shoulder. Now, this one's going to be deeper, and this is going to tax me because I've got it. This cuts almost an inch. See how we did. All right, let's put that up right in the vise. That actually wasn't too bad. A little bit of a ridge there. So I'm going to come in here from this end. Got it locked securely in the vise. It show back here where I'm holding the chisel. See I'll how I got that. the chisel nestled in my palm, and I can put my weight, body weight, behind it. So I'm going to get in here and I'm going to set it on that little. Remember, I said make sure you make your marking gauge nice and deep because that line will be your friend all the way through this process. So I'm going to set the chisel right on that marking gauge line, and then just pair. This chisel needs to be sharpened. I want to make sure I don't, you can see the tracks where the, uh, right there, where I've just 
it had some nicks in the edge of the blade. That's what that's coming from. But I don't feel any uh, any raised area, so that should be good. Now this is the part where I'm going to have to come in and examine and decide whether or not I'm going to have to pare a little bit off of this. I'm actually going to try to assemble it first before I do that because I'd like to think I was able to take this right from the saw. But I may have to come in here and just trim that a little bit and I feel a little bit of shoulder left right there. So maybe we'll have to do that. How are we for time? We're out. We're out? Okay, well that's all right. We did, that's, that, we'll go through on the next episode and we'll fit this. And then uh, I think I'll do another one because I'll show you a few little helpers that you can use to get you a little farther along the process before you end up trying to tackle this entirely with just using the saw and right off of the scribe lines. So we'll see you back here on our next episode and we'll proceed from there. Yeah.